Welcome to the CIMP Leader Panel. My name is Siegfried Kasper. I am the president of CIMP and today I have distinguished colleagues with me, Professor Carol Taminga, Professor Gobi and Professor John Crystal. And we have the topic of new medication for schizophrenia. And I would like to ask our worldwide expert, Professor Carl Taminga, to give us a, a short statement what a new medication for this disease. So I'd love to, I'd love to address that. Um, new discoveries and potentially new medications are coming um, up all the time. So it makes this a very exciting age. From year to year, new discoveries come up. Um, and, and next year in Taipei, likely there will be many new discoveries that are discussed. Schizophrenia is a serious disease, um, whereas in depression you can talk about treatment responsive and treatment non-responsive. In schizophrenia, m most people have treatment non-responsive illness, even if they um, have some slight uh, response to antipsychotic medications. All of our antipsychotic medications to date have been dopamine receptor antagonists. They've been pure dopamine receptor antagonists. They've been mixed dopamine receptor antagonists with anti-D2 receptors, with um, anti-D2 receptors plus 5-HT2 antagonists, which have been really all of the second generation anti-psychotics. Um, there was a phase in there when we were looking at partial dopamine agonists. These are agonists which have a complete occupancy, but a incomplete effect, uh, a, a, an incomplete agonist effect on dopamine receptors so that they're tacit dopamine receptor antagonists, although we like to call them a new treatment. They weren't very new, um, although they had much reduced side effects, so that, that was an improvement. Um, now there's coming a group of um, antipsychotics that we're getting a chance to test. We don't have the results yet. Um, there's a new drug which is being developed by Synovian, which is a, a, a trace amine. They call their drug TAR1, T-A-R-1. Um, really, it's called SCP-862 or 863, something that has a number. And um, this drug looked very good in, in, in early animal studies. It looked so good that the company tested it in a phase 2B study, and that also was positive. So now they're uh, going ahead to start, uh, really, their registration trials um, in schizophrenia. So um, this will not touch the D2 receptors anymore? It will not touch the D2 receptors. It's been tested on D2 receptors, and it does not have any binding affinity for D2 receptors. And also not weight gaining? No weight gain? Uh, well, the studies have been short so far, but in four-week studies, we're even with um, second generation antipsychotics, you got a hint of weight gain. There isn't any hint. There was the big enemies, the D2 with the extrapyramidal side effects, and the next There's no one side effects. with the metabolic syndrome. So right. that's good that yeah. we have the new yeah. avenues. Mm -hmm. So the field is now going back to old drugs that failed, at least failed in one study design, and one is muscarinic agonist. Uh, muscarinic agonist, yes. Mm. Um, Several years ago, there was a drug called xenomaline that was, uh, that was uh, tried and had an effect on cognition in schizophrenia and, in, fa in fact, had a, had a signal on psychosis itself. It was a Lilly drug at the time. And it was rolled into, schizophrenia was rolled into their Alzheimer trials. And the drug really failed in Alzheimer's disease because it had, had too many side effects. So, um, but, the, but nobody really looked into the signal in schizophrenia. So that's a, an, an M, as an M4 agonist. And there are also some M1 agonists that are coming forward uh, for treatment. Um, and, then, um, and then there was the, there's an m gluar um, 2 3 antagonist, which also was a Lilly drug, proglutetamide. Pro, pro Glumatad. 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 That really failed in Lilly's large studies. Um, but there were enough clues in those studies to indicate a target population, perhaps young people, early psychosis that might be responsive. In fact, that's being taken back. I think the idea is that maybe we just can't call drugs in schizophrenia good for all psychosis, good for mm -hmm. all schizophrenia. We have to know how to bin things so that biology is closer to the drug mm. action. So you would rather move away from the classical, like positive symptoms, negative symptoms, more to 
smaller groups of underlying biology, but we don't have biomarkers. What do you, what do you do? We don't that? have biomarkers yet, but I think that there's many different groups that are, okay. that are pulling together biomarkers mm -hmm. so that we can develop biomarker selective populations. Very good. So what do my dear colleagues think about this, uh, Dr. Gobi? Mm -hmm. No, I think uh, it's uh, an important moment also for the treatment of schizophrenia, this uh, trace amino receptor one uh, antagonist or partial agonist as a completely new avenue for uh, the field of schizophrenia. Finally, we have uh, something new. It seems that uh, this receptor indirectly can uh, modulate uh, the dopamine uh, to receptor that is uh, crucial also for the treatment of schizophrenia. Very interesting uh, uh, experiment uh, in our laboratory in animals. Uh, where we saw that uh, <coughs> high doses of LSD can induce uh, <coughs> a modulation of dopamine with the psychosis effect in rats. And actually, the TAR1 antagonist can block this uh, psychosis effect uh, in uh, animals. So very interesting. Very interesting. I think that uh, basic research has uh, very widely demonstrated that uh, this uh, novel uh, TAR1 uh, antagonist or partial agonist could be really a new avenue for uh, schizophrenia. I wonder if there's any evidence that, um, mm. that, the, that cannabis works through systems like that and one could really take people who, ha who have psychosis with, uh, ca with various cannabis drugs and do the same sort of thing. Yes, in fact, this is very interesting because uh, the receptor that is uh, very expressed in our brain, uh, this TAR1 uh, receptor, we still uh, don't know what is the endogenous ligand. So could be or uh, endocannabinoids or could be the endogenous hallucinogenic that act through this receptor. We still love to explore uh, really a world uh, in this field. So Dr. Crystal, uh, recently everybody knows you worldwide about your treatment resistance studies, but you have a very sound knowledge also in schizophrenia. What is your uh, thinking in this field? Well, I, I, think, um, I think that there are a number of mechanisms like the muscarinic agonism yeah. that the field has been interested in for a long time. Dopamine one receptor agonism mm -hmm. is another one. Um, and there are others that we really have never been able to explore, partly because mm. the academic uh, community didn't really have access to the drugs to use in clinical trials that could have been more targeted, as, as mm -hmm. Dr. Taminga referred to, to subgroups of patients with uh, more discernible pathology. Um, as the biology of, of schizophrenia develops, I think we have the possibility, uh, and the work of uh, Professor Taminga's consortium, uh, which is trying to develop uh, subtyping strategies for schizophrenia, may be an example of one path that could potentially take us forward to uh, help match patients to the treatments that they need. I think that there's a, a feeling that that many different kinds of uh, evidence may ultimately be used for this kind of subtyping because we're seeing um, uh, the uh, polygenic risk for schizophrenia emerging and many, many different genes involved in, in, in that um, a polygenic risk estimation. So I think it's an exciting time. I think that, that it's a time where the science is probably going to change fairly rapidly. And I would just add one other, other uh, caveat, which is that most of the novel experimental strategies that have been, been explored and which have failed, alpha-7 nicotinic agonist, uh, many subtype receptor agonists and antagonists, Dr. Ming and I have a library of, of hmm. mechanisms that we have respectively explored. None of them have been tested early in the course of schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And it would be very interesting to re-explore these mechanisms early in the course of mm -hmm. schizophrenia as adjunctive or preventive treatments to see whether they might play a role at a phase of the illness where overall clinical response is likely to be greater. Mm -hmm. And I think that idea is actually a novel and important one that I think that the field will increasingly adopt in testing 
these novel therapeutic mechanisms. Well, very, very important to start very treatment very early, like very we know it from yeah. other medical diseases, diabetes or high blood pressure. So probably when we come to a later stage, right, then the biology is already that changed. But let me address also a very important point from a, uh, a practical point of view. We now have a one month and a three month depot medication. When you look at the data, they look fascinating. So I always say, well, if this data would be available for doctors of internal medicine, they would not hesitate to give this three months uh, supply to their patients. But psychiatrists are still very re reluctant to give it their patients. Could somebody address this question also? Oh, I do believe that, they, that there was just a little familiarity um, a, a problem. And the one month and the, the three month are injections so that, they, that, there, that, that there's some practical um, work that has to go with how do we actually do this. But I think what I've been surprised about is patient report. And mm -hmm. the patient report for these long acting drugs, I was thinking would be quite negative. Um, but in fact, it's very positive. Yeah. Um, the patients have uh, smoother pl plasma levels. They have fewer side effects. They don't have to remember to take their medicines. People aren't yelling at them all the time for having, um, mm -hmm. th having not taken their medicines and things. I think it's going to be a thing that's going to uh, that's going to come quickly. One thing that I just wanted to mention, especially along with the early psychosis, is the um, immu the immunological um, causes for mm -hmm. schizophrenic psychosis. I don't know if you want to call them schizophrenia, but anti-NMDA receptor mm -hmm. autoantibodies produce a syndrome that looks exactly like schizophrenia. And it's particularly florid in young people, and people have made the estimates up to 5%. And those kind of people, of course, don't get treated with antipsychotics at all. In fact, they don't respond to them, and they get treated with immunological therapies. Hmm. So I think that that will be a, um, a, lot, of, a, a lot of us now, especially uh, who, who look at early psychosis, are looking at the incidence of those kinds of very treatable causes mm -hmm. of psychosis. How can you recognize uh, psychosis due to anti-NMD NMD antibodies uh, compared with a normal psychosis? Uh, do we have some uh, So we're just testing. There, there yeah. are very um, weak predictors, like okay. if they don't re respond well to antipsychotic drugs, if they come down with their psychosis very quickly, and if they don't have a what we used to call a poor premorbid course, they may mm -hmm. have um, a, a, they have a may have an immunological reason, but I think you just have to test for it. You can measure plasma, you can measure okay. CSF. Okay, CSF. Very important issue, right? So I think we covered different areas, and uh, Professor Teminga showed us very nicely. In the old days, we had the pure D2 blockers, which unfortunately still are used quite a lot worldwide, but. Uh, should not be used to the side effects, but the next generation were the D2, 5-HT2 blockers. But she showed us also the new avenues with all the different receptor possibilities, which will help us to have a biological basis, a subgrouping. Unfortunately, psychiatry doesn't get cheaper with this. Very likely gets much more expensive, but I think we should be proud that we can mm -hmm. treat these patients also with these new compounds. And what would I also like to say, it's very important to have this long injectable medication available. And I have the same experience like you said, well, the patients, as a matter of fact, liked it. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. uh, we should not give it the so-called bad patients. We should give it also to patients who are reliable. Mm -hmm. And because I always explain to them, well, you have a smooth plasma level. And by the way, you don't have to think every day that you should take and your mother is not getting after you. <laughs> Did you take the medication? But I think these are very good data and these might also change our understanding of the illness and the underlying biology. But as I mentioned before, there is a lot of new moments with uh, biology and new medication to explore and subtyping our patients will be the future. So I thank very much the distinguished panel for joining us. Thank and I thank you.